This is a podcast about both having autism and living with someone who has autism. My mom is Sonia, and I'm Josh, and this is Josh Has Autism. Hey everybody, thanks for stopping by this week. I appreciate it. We have a very, very special guest um, here with with me today, and um, this is Dr. Christine Ogilvie. She's an autism expert currently with Florida State University, the Center for Autism and Related Disabilities. It's something that that, uh, we know of as CARD. Um, So welcome, Chrissy. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Yeah, very cool. So you're an autism expert. That's what they tell me. (laughs) That's what they tell you. (laughs) So um, you say that you tripped and fell in love with autism. Absolutely, yes. I was a middle school teacher for 11 years, uh, had just graduated with, I had my, got my bachelor's in special ed, my master's in special ed, uh, and had graduated with the master's thinking that I knew everything. Uh, and, then I found, <laughs> and then I found a position, uh, this was in Massachusetts where I, where I lived, and I found a position with nine students, uh, grades five through eight. Um, that had all kinds of diagnoses. There were kids with autism, kids with obsessive compulsive disorder, attention deficit disorder, some more intensive um, mental and cognitive disorders. Uh, and the principal said to me, uh, contain them. And that was that was what I was supposed to do. And of course, I knew everything, so I thought, no problem. That's great. <laughs> now, meanwhile, I was teaching reading language, math, science, social studies to grades five, six, seven, eight. And the kids were awesome. They were, we had a really good time. I had really good staff, but I went to the principal one day and said, you know what, I can't do this. Uh, and he just kind of looked at me and I, I explained to him, I said, I'm, I'm teaching every subject in four grades. I said, and none of which I am the content area expert in. So here's what I want to do. I want to start prepping them uh, to in, be included in the general education classroom and I can work with the teachers. And that. Um, and he was a very, very smart man uh, because he realized that if my program didn't exist, these kids most likely would end up in residential which to the tune of at that time, it's a lot more expensive now, would have been $90,000 per year per kid. Wow. So he invested in me. I Mm -hmm. apparently had some confidence in me uh, and gave me wonderful staff, more wonderful staff. Uh, And so we started doing inclusion. And one of the first classes that we went to was art. uh, And that was going to be kind of our first trial period there and we showed up at the art teacher's door and she looked at me and she met us at the door and I had all nine of my students with me and she said you have to go you have to take them away I can't teach them and so again I knew everything uh, with my masters and had uh, I stepped back for about 10 seconds and I looked at her I said well you are going to teach them and that's just (laughs) how it is Uh, I said I said but I'll tell you what instead of just leaving them here I'll stay and you manage the art piece because I can't draw a stick figure without one-to-one assistance (laughs) Um, and I'll handle behaviors that you might be concerned about Uh, and I'd love to tell you it was all sunshine and roses and everything went wonderfully from the start but it didn't uh, we had we definitely had our ups and downs and our, our thorns happening, but by the end of the year, she was my kid's biggest fan and was telling everyone, "You have to include these kids. You have to give this a chance." Uh, and so, really, um, you know, I tripped and fell in love because by at that time, most of the kids in my program uh, were people on the autism spectrum. I had never had a class in any of my education about working with kids with autism. It was really learning by trial, but I, it was it was fascinating and challenging and tough. Uh, and it and so I just that was that's my story. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what what year was that? That was ninety five or ninety six. Okay. So things were very different in the school system then than they are now. Absolutely. Yeah. And so you were talking about inclusion before I imagined there was any such thing as inclusion. Most of the time it had been social inclusion, which they would take a child with special needs um, and include them 
and uh, air quotes, and include them in the general education class, but that inclusion would be the child sitting in the back of the room, maybe with the one-to-one assistant, uh, but it was social inclusion only. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't, it wasn't meaningful inclusion, and inclusion is hard. Uh, you need to have the right supports. You need to have the right training. Um, there needs, if there's co-teaching going on, you need to have the, that kind of relationship that go there. Inclusion, it doesn't happen immediately or without some trials, but it's so worth it, uh, and you can see the difference. So you turned into Mama Bear and went to bat for these kids that, oh, was- that you had, you know just fallen for that <laughs> that they just meant something to you in a very special way and so from there and from that point in time you were doing something that was clearly wonderful and uh, necessary for, for for the group of kids that you got how why did that end and you how was it so at that point you had a master's degree I did and what took place that caused you to leave that position where it sounds like you really enjoyed that and caused you to go back to school (laughs) well I've always been kind of a school geek I have to admit that (laughs) Uh, I really like taking classes Uh, but as the years and I was in that specific position for my goodness that for eight years I had already been teaching before that Uh, but as the years went on and on I was co-teaching with a lot more teachers. I was seeing the successes. Uh, and I said, you know, I want to do more than this. I want to I want to go back to school. I want to get my doctorate. So that's what I can do. I can teach teachers how to work with kids with special needs and more specifically with kids with autism. They are they have won my heart uh, and really, you know, that I had found my found my tribe. <laughs> I guess. Uh, and so I I did it. I uh Decided that I didn't like snow anymore, uh, and so started applying to different schools uh, and had applied down in Florida, and I eventually ended up at University of Central Florida. Uh, the uh, I had applied and had been accepted to another university, uh, but I'm not a researcher, and it was a university that focused on research, and so they had referred me to University of Central Florida. And as it just so happened, the director of the program was going to be in my area in Massachusetts the following week that all of this went down. Uh, and so <laughs> I, I really, I mean, the, the stars aligned. I don't know what yeah. happened, but something came together that it was going to be the right place for me. Right, right. So, yeah, those things don't happen by accident. No, I definitely, something had to be had to be guiding the way. Uh, and uh, I had shocked my family very much when I announced one day that uh, I said, by the way, I'm moving to Florida and I'm going to get my doctorate. <laughs> uh, it was, so that You're was like, fun. What? Yeah, that was fun. <laughs> yeah. When you were teaching um, before this, t- this time period, when you took your students to the art teacher, mm-hmm. so you were, was it something that you recognized that you would get some uh, kiddos come into your class and were you able to um, see how they um, um, communicated maybe differently or learned differently back then or was it the the what is it I don't even know if you can if you can <laughs> pinpoint this what what was it that you were immediately attracted to with uh, people on the autism spectrum I think part of it was that it, it stretched me so much that it was, I didn't have any training. I had very little experience, um, but every day I walked in uh, and there would be something new and there would be some light bulb that would go off and say, oh yes, you know, I, I learned the very hard way that you, with our loved ones with autism, change always isn't the easiest thing, uh, and had rearranged my room one afternoon I was feeling very very you know driven and I thought all right we're going to try this we're kind of in a a stalemate right now with things Uh, I rearranged the whole room top to bottom uh, and I had a student named Sam who came in uh, that morning and things did not go well Uh, she tried to put my room back to where the way it was and not in the most calm 
way of things. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that was my lesson for the day. You know what? You can't just do this, Chrissy. You can't just change what you are. That was what I thought to myself. You can't just all of a sudden make these huge changes. The, um, I'm, I tend to be, especially when I was teaching a, a planner, uh, and would spend a lot of time planning lessons and prepping materials and all that. And without a doubt, another lesson learned, uh, you can plan as much as you want. Uh, but you're go- things aren't always going to go the way you, uh, way you want them to, but they might take off in a totally wonderful different way. And, and they might crash and burn. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that was... That, I think, was what I loved about working with kids with autism because I didn't know what was going to happen and I could take whatever they are going to teach me uh, and use it to work out things in the future and learn things that don't ever do that again. It's not (laughs) going to work. So I don't know if if I can pinpoint exactly how I knew someone was ready for or, or someone should be included. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I knew that what I needed to do in order to best serve them would be to prepare them as much as I could and give them as much support as I could to get them out there. And it Mm -hmm. felt good to do that. So I've seen you interact with your kiddos, as you call them, Mm -hmm. on the autism spectrum. There's something very um, heartwarming and unique about the way that you draw them out. And... That that's something that you bring to it that I don't know that you could learn. And to me, that's just something that's a part of you. That's who you are. This is what you what you offer them is a a safe place, and understanding. So when you talk about sometimes they excel and sometimes they crash and burn, the thing that I hope that we're doing through this podcast and I see you doing out there, which is to not label this as a good, bad, right, or wrong. It just is. And that's something that I've seen you do, it's seen you in action here, where something might start going off into the deep end, <laughs> and you're able to assess what's happening and really connect with, with um, your kids on, an emo- on, on a deep level. I was going to say emotional level. I don't know where that is, that you connect right. with them, but, but you find them, and you're able to help them maneuver through and I think that that's a quality that you bring to what you do and to anybody on the autism spectrum, which is to really see them. And not everybody sees them. Right. True story. Yeah. Well, thank you, for one thing. Uh, the uh, One of the uh, amazing characteristics, uh, I don't know, I hate to describe it as that, uh, but one of the amazing, for lack of a better word, one of the amazing things... Uh, about working with individuals with autism is uh, if you've, and I did not make this up, I heard it from somebody, but if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. They are, it is most decidedly a spectrum of strengths and and deficits, uh, but you can't, and I think one of the things that I realized through my education and, and through just interacting with it is I can't meet a person with autism and say, okay, this is going to work every single time. Uh, and I also can't, I, some of the individuals that I work with don't have verbal communication skills, but they can communicate in other ways. And I don't, I don't know how I know. It really just seems to be something that, that happens. Uh, and I have, you know, at the different end of the spectrum, you know, I have my individuals, you know, like Josh, who have amazing verbal and communication skills for some things. Hmm. Uh, they are, but just learning to to recognize that and seeing them, okay, this kiddo comes into my office, I just have to look at that kiddo. I can't say, oh, he's here or she's here in a certain area. And that, it's just a matter of saying, okay, what are you going to show me? Yeah. Is that something that you bring to the the autism community? Or is that something, or and, slash and, something that's being taught um, to to anybody that wants wants to focus on the autism spectrum is that something that's taught or is that something that is just an innate part of who you are i really i think it's an innate part of who i am and i think i've very been very lucky too that i've worked with other individuals that just just get it 
that um, are very much, I don't think it's something, what I mean by saying that is, I don't think it's something that that is exclusive to me. Mm-hmm. Um, am, I, am I really good at it? Yes. Uh, because I really love it, uh, and it fuels me <laughs> to be able to do it. Uh, I don't. I don't think that it can be taught, though. I think that that, you know, and I I see teaching as as a profession, in all means, and I think that that uh, people are born to be teachers, uh, if that's what they're meant to be. But you're not a teacher right now, in the in the in the traditional. Um, a term or understanding, I think, right? Right. Right. So, what is it that you do? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. The, uh, well, I'm very lucky. Um, I work for a wonderful organization, uh, and uh, I'm able to, to do a lot of things. One of my favorite things that I do is get to interact with the community because I feel like it's very important to get my individuals that I work with out into the community. Um, to to remove that, oh, you've met someone with autism, this is what autism is. And also to give the kiddos, and I say kiddos, but I really work with middle, high school, and adults, um, but they're always going to be my kiddos. <laughs> uh, they, I say that, you know, they, they need this experience, and the community needs the experience of interacting with individuals with autism. Uh, one, of, one of the areas that I, I see most often is my folks with autism um, have difficulty in social interactions, not interpreting body language or understanding physical language, physical um, physical characteristics and that of someone or taking things very literally. Uh, and so what I try to do is to contrive these experiences as uh, best I can. Uh, We're working right now with the National Flight Academy, who has been absolutely incredible to work with. Um, And we are including middle school and high school kids in their National Flight Academy programs. And so they have six-day deployments where it's an Mm -hmm. overnight camp, and they go and they fly the simulators. Um, And those are for our guys that, that... probably have better communication skills uh, and better functional skills and better, um, what's the word, Um, adaptation skills as far as being able to handle new experiences. And then we have our one-day adventures, um, and this is for middle and high school again, but anybody on the autism spectrum, we can accommodate, with the exception of those who have, because of safety, have demonstrated uh, aggressive behaviors in the past, but we can accommodate individuals who may not be able to verbally communicate or may have more specific needs. Uh, and again, this has been a collaborative partnership with National Flight Academy. They have invested in time, uh, in training to be able to do this. And it's, it's a fully inclusive uh, experience for everybody. So the, the uh, Flight Academy is in Pensacola, Florida. Yes. And is this open to um, just the community, or is it open to regardless of where the the kids live? It's regardless of where the kids live. Uh, One of the um, initiatives that we're doing this year is, rather than just even within our two counties here, to recruit people we want to recruit throughout the state of Florida and all without individuals with autism um, throughout the United States. And we already have... uh, Potential people coming for our six-day deployment from Arkansas, from Alabama, from Massachusetts, which is very, very exciting because it means that that we're really making an impact all over instead of just in in our Pensacola area. So this the flight academy is a new opportunity. Yes, that you're helping to to develop with the wonderful folks that work there. Yes, and. What is it exactly? Um, what's the what will the benefit be for the kids that go there? Well, it will be benefits for everybody that that goes there. For my guys with autism, they uh, will have the chance to interact with others, but more we can key in on some of their interests, some of their strengths that are really good. That attention to detail. The I've seen over and over again as far as technology goes our guys having amazing skills with that and so it really can focus on can 
give them the chance to demonstrate and to show, hey, I've got these great things. You know, I have this this title of autism, but I there are so many things that I can do. And for the kids without uh, without autism, they get to experience uh, these amazing people that they might not otherwise have known and so I have I have an ulterior motive in all this uh, because you know my my very secret I guess now not secret um, motive for this is I really want to create an environment in a world and everywhere that is that can meet someone with autism and say okay why not let's include them Let's do something. You know, that kid can be my friend. Or for our older guys, I can hire that person because of the strengths that they can see in them. Right. And that's a passion of yours. That's not just a, a, an idea or a motive. That you, That's a very much a passion. Yes. And one thing that you do out in the community that I think is so beneficial, so it's not just locally here, it's the other counties as well, so when you're out doing what you do, you give presentations that are called Autism 101, um, which I think is a really cool name. Can you explain what you do? I do. Yes, I can. They are. Uh, it's an overview of autism, and I do a little bit about the statistics of autism that we know about, and then I talk about the different characteristics and really break it down into communication, social, and behavioral needs, because those are three of the defining characteristics, whether it's strengths or deficits in those areas. Um, and what I love to do is I love to, I put whoever the audience is, I put them through simulations. And I put them in the place of what it might be like to be one person with autism at one time during one period, uh, huh. one length, because they, they, you, there's nothing that's going to work all the time. And I think it's important that it may not work all the time, but it may work tomorrow, but it, and it may not work the next day, and it might work at 9 o'clock in the morning, but, geez, at 3 o'clock you try the same thing, it might not. Uh, which again is one of the things that really excites me about working with people with autism because it's always that okay what am I doing wrong that's not working what am I doing right that is so this the autism 101 um, it also gives me a chance to get out into the community to say you know hey you know you've heard about autism you might have heard stereotypes about autism and you, you might think that everyone you meet with autism is the same but it's a chance for me to say you know it's not really you know, or not at all, to be more exact. Um, but And then to describe the characteristics that I talked about, but also then to say, okay, here are some strategies and, and try this out. And it's been really neat. The community, especially here in the Pensacola area, has been very receptive to this. Uh, and I've, we've branched out, and I'm not alone in this. Our other card consultants have also taken on this part as part of our, our mission. Um, we've reached out to first responders to we do trainings with different schools there's a training at national flight academy um, different community organizations and that so really the getting it out there and so people can have this this experience and welcome it and really learn that that you know there are just amazing things that they don't know about it because they hear about autism uh and think oh it must be the person that is sitting down and rocking or flapping their hands or the person um, who really doesn't seem to, to fit in or meet what other people would continue would consider the, the norms of what it is to interact. I read somewhere recently that there's well over three million people with autism now. And you know, I don't know. I say now, but I don't know if that's something new or is there, are they just, the, the diagnosis is, um, has changed the numbers. I don't know which came first. You know what I'm saying is that. Right. It's really chicken or egg there yeah. that, that you can't. I mean, the numbers as of 2013, 2014 from the Center for Control, Disease and Control Prevention is, uh, were one in 68. Okay. When I started my doctorate in 2005, I believe the numbers at that time were around one in five hundred. Wow. Yes. Yeah, so there there have been an increase in the 
in the numbers and nobody really can tell you why we know a lot more about autism uh, than we do now a lot more about diagnosing a lot more about early intervention a lot more than early di- a lot more about early diagnosis um, and there are a whole bunch of theories that um, that different people will attribute to it and I don't know Mm-hmm. what the answer is people I get and I get asked that question all the time and I all I can say is well I don't really know but here are some things some theories that are out there so I want to get down to the stuff <laughs> that parents you know or or that might be helpful for the parents that are raising somebody with autism or they have somebody that has autism in their family one thing that you do is a big focus for you um, are social groups for kids as well as adults. And so in those social groups, I imagine you have, just like any group, different personalities and varying levels of, of um, understandings and, and competency. It just doesn't matter who you're talking about. You get a group of people, those are things that are, that, are, that right. statement's going to be valid regardless. Um one of the things that you just mentioned is the difference of, of uh, the varying um, success that somebody has uh, that has autism, that's on the autism spectrum, and therefore their family is experiencing very levels of success, and their and their or their caregivers, their schools, the teachers, the, whomever it is. is the thing that seems to always be elusive is how to figure out a plan to get you somewhere to help get them somewhere that's really going to make a difference. I know that there's been times where Josh had some services um, where they're just they're they're eliminating those services for him, and as his mom, I felt like he really needed those. One of the thing the, the the questions that the um, um, organization asked me to provide in order to consider keeping those: How many times a day does he do this? How many times a day does he do that? And it was eye opening for me. That was my very first experience with somebody wanting me to have concrete answers for something that fe- feels so abstract. And it, it was very difficult. I was I was surprised by it. And it actually it was kind of a, it was upsetting because my my experience was you can't ask me how I mean if I had known this is what you were going to ask, I could have kept track of this. I'm not a I'm not, I'm not a a list kind of person, so I don't you know, and, and I'm not that organized, so I don't. <laughs> so I didn't have that jotted down anywhere, and I didn't have it even in my mind to know that I'm supposed to pay attention to what happens each day. Or, you know, what I realized is that even if I could have written this down, it is not an actual or an accurate description of who he is. Because if I said that he had five experiences where he shut down today, yesterday he might not have had any, yet the experience of the surroundings, his environment could have been the same exact thing. He could have had the same thing to eat. He could have done the same exact activity that day, and yet you put them side by side and it's, it's 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 an experience that's so vastly different from one to the next that there's no rhyme or reason to it it feels like it feels like once we figure out okay this works uh, he shows us that it doesn't <laughs> he does <laughs> yeah so i i sometimes when we, when we do this podcast i always try to make sure that i'm speaking about josh and because I can't speak for other parents, I can't speak for other situations. But what is it that you see? Is it is, is there is there a um, is there a way to figure out how to be the most helpful from day to day? Is there a solution? Do you have 
Chrissy, do you have a magic solution? <laughs> huh? Huh? Jeez, I, I would love to be that great and powerful Visitor Boss. Um, uh, no, mm. I, I, re- I really don't. And I think one of the things that, that you, you mentioned this before um, that parents are asked to do, they're asked to quantify yes. behaviors. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you can't. You know, can I you know, try to, to notice how many times things happen and and you alluded to this too you don't know why it happens Uh, when I talk with Josh uh, he and I can sit down the first time I met Josh he came to my office and I think he was there for at least I know he was there for at least three hours and we just talked the whole time about every about everything Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I I came away from that with Josh thinking oh my gosh there's so many things we can do with this and there's so many things that we can do and boy I just want to hang out with this guy (laughs) because he's so interesting and smart uh, and funny and all that and yet Josh is an assistant for me uh, in my one of my middle school groups and, and endlessly valuable but it re- it requires me because of the mystery of Josh, I guess, that I text him every Tuesday and say, by the way, we have class at this time and it's at this location. Um, and he will tell me later, he's like, oh, it's a good thing that, that you did that. Um, but I don't understand that. And I, I think that and I, I have I've asked him why before. Can you tell me? Because maybe you have the answer. And I know you've talked about this with him in previous podcasts and he's like I don't know it's just how it is and I, I thought well come on you know? <laughs> people so, get me ask me this question you need to give me the answer so you're saying mm. that he he's so beneficial when he's like mentoring in these groups and yet he doesn't remember that the groups are going to take place and he doesn't remember where right. he's supposed to meet that's what you're talking about. Like, here's this person that is is incredibly intelligent, and these pieces that would seem like a no-brainer are missing. Yes. Yeah. The, um, and I, I, I honestly could not do the class as effectively um, as I do with without Josh. And I've noticed that, um, I think, for one class he wasn't there because he was not feeling well. Um, but he he brings insights and he brings up things uh, in the class that that the middle schoolers get and can reach them in a way that I really can't. No matter how hard I try, no matter what I do, he'll say a very simple phrase and they'll be like, oh, yeah, so I, I totally get that. <laughs> but then at the same time, in the same class, he might do something that I think, oh, please don't ever do that again. <laughs> uh, these these are middle schoolers, and they're going to take off and run. You're being funny, and oh. absolutely. But a lot of times with this particular group, um, they, they they take it and run. And it's all of a sudden a simple laugh at a, at a joke is just a ginormous explosion of laughter, which sometimes is joyful, but not when you're trying to get eight middle schoolers back on task because you Mm -hmm. only have a bit of time and so it's a I hate to call it a contradiction because I don't I don't like that word but it's a it's a conundrum to me Mm. how he can totally add so much to the class and then at the same time can make me have to you know kind of drop back and punt uh, (laughs) and trying to get things back and I don't it's. I think that's that's one of the reasons why I love doing what I'm doing too. Uh, are the Joshes mm. uh, to to see that? And I don't know if it's my quest to, to have the answers when parents ask me that. You know, what you know, or when physicians ask me, you know, how to quantify or what to do about it, and how and how to to market uh, that. How to market as a behavior happening. Um, and you mentioned the same situation on a different day. Everything ate the same. All the environment is different, um, but there could have been one tiny thing that you or I wouldn't notice, that a parent might not notice, um, that really changes that the whole experience for that day. It might have been something that happened in sleep. It might have been that um, one little thing was changed or different. I really, I can't, other than saying one little thing, I really can't tell you what it even might remotely be mm-hmm. you know and as parents it must be very difficult that or for anyone caregivers that are working with the joshes of the world 
that um, because the, you can't control it uh, or you can't, that's not a right word. You can't, it's very challenging to be able to predict. Uh, I, I call it, um, they are predictably unpredictable, <laughs> uh, which is the best explanation that I can say. But I'm, it, I'm, I've talked with parents and I've talked with caregivers uh, and it is very, very frustrating. Uh, the best things that you can do is um, realize immediately that, that things are, are going to change um, and have a backup plan. That they are going to change? Most likely. <laughs> okay. Most likely. That they are, and on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis, on an hour-to-hour -hour basis, it's going to happen. Um, it doesn't mean that there, there's no negative connotation that goes along with that statement at all. Uh, it's There's nothing that it, that is wrong with that. It's just a matter of saying, you know what? All right. This really didn't rock. Uh, and it's... It's very easy for me to sit here and say that I'm I'm not a parent, you know, except for the the furry, the furries in my house, my dogs and my cats that seem to think that they're children. Um, and so it's easy for me to sit back and say, sure, you know, you're you're doing this twenty four seven. I might do it, you know. I definitely don't do it that often. So it's easy for me to say, sure, drop back and punt and try something else. Uh, I I. Accept and acknowledge uh, that's not the, as simple as I'm making it sound. Well, it is something that uh, I've learned through Josh that there are just things that, it, and it is baffling, and it seems so confusing that here's a person that is extremely intelligent, articulate, very handsome. <laughs> yes. Uh, and he will say something, he will have a plan that he comes up with, and then everybody gets on board. And, every, you know, people are invested now. Okay, this is what he's going to do, so let's help him to make this happen. Let's be that support net for him. And that might, he might be moving forward, and then all of a sudden it's done. He's over it leaving those of us that have been there supporting him baffled by what just happened. What did, if it's a change of mind, why? If it's all of a sudden a dis disinterest in that particular thing, what happened? Where did you go? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. It, and it, it's, it's something that happens repetitively. And I can't say that there's a difference from him now as an adult or when he was a kid doing this. It feels different when he's a kid because I'm mom, so yeah. I step in and, and, you know, just do the mom stuff. I The same thing I did with Bug. <laughs> you know, if she said something, she wanted something, I would try to, you know, help her move that direction. If she changed her mind, she changed her mind. Well, it was really since he became an adult that I realized that this is a stark difference from changing his mind mm -hmm. it's almost like it's almost as if he just hit this brick wall and there's no going further no matter what the people around him then has have put in place to help him to be successful in this particular thing that he brought up to begin with right um there, it's no movements over it's not going to happen and it's we, we then we need to we learn to let it go Right. And I, I think, um, you know, as part of, of Team Josh, uh, I've experienced that with you and, mm -hmm. and so seen the supports that you put in place. I've tried to be part of it. And then all of a sudden, it's just done. Uh, mm -hmm. And the uh, there's the, the movie uh, Forrest Gump, which has nothing to do with autism. But the scene where Tom Hanks is running and running and running, and then he just stops and says, all right, I'm done with that. <laughs> that's, that's what I think of. I'm, I, and I, I just want to say, well, why? You know, why, why did this, where did this, this come from? And I've tried to, I mean, and you might not know this, uh, when, especially when it comes to Josh, had sat down and gotten inside my head and say, okay, what wasn't there? What were the supports that were there? What was happening? How were things? 
did things get too hard? Did he just decide he didn't want to do it? Um, and I don't, I don't know. And I, I've, I've asked him in the past, and he just would just, well, that's just how it is, and, and couldn't, you know, that it, that's just what happened, mm-hmm. and not in a flip, not in an, an obstinate kind of way. It's just I'm done with that, mm-hmm. and it, and over. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's a, I can imagine from a parent's point of view, uh, that that's. 150,000 times more intense than for me as someone who's just part of Team Josh um, to think, well, what? Mm-hmm. Why? Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know that there's ever going to be an answer to that. If, if Josh can't answer it, I can't even imagine that I can wrap my head around it. And it really seems like something that he tries on our behalf to find the answer. Mm-hmm. It, it, you're absolutely right. It's just not, he, he doesn't just say, oh, because... Right. And, you know, so what? It, it, he really is thoughtful about it. Now, when it stops, there's no th- being thoughtful about it. It's done. Yes. It's like you said. Yeah. Think, there's no, it's non-negotiable <laughs> there at that point. Right. It doesn't matter what. You know, there's no, as, as he said it before, it's like that dangling carrot, you know, mm-hmm. like, uh, or on his half dangling uh, um, uh, Boston cream donut. Ah, oh, even better. <laughs> I like yeah. that idea better. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not going to get him to chase that. He's, it's like, I think it's a perfect analogy. I never <laughs> thought of that with the forest Gump. And I, that's a perfect analogy though, because that's what it feels like. And, and it, we have no clue. So we're blindsided pretty much as parents daily when something is just not working. A part of Josh, too, is that he can talk to you about any subject intelligently. And at the same time, life skills are extremely difficult. Um, certain, certain functions that we take for granted as adults that we just get up and we do, they don't happen without prompting and redirecting and reminding. And sometimes that gets exhausting and it's also confusing because at one minute, in one minute, this person is very vibrant and articulate and is able to express himself so well. And then, then right after that, the most mundane um, necessity doesn't happen. And it doesn't feel like it's out of resistance either. It just feels like it's not... In, in in his con- realm of consciousness that this mm-hmm. needs to happen. Oh, and you've said to me before when when you've talked to him about this, and he said it to me as well. Um, when I when I've been like, you know, how can you not remember to do this? And very plainly and very honestly and very meaningfully, he, he'd just say, "Well, it just is not something I've thought about, mm-hmm. or I didn't think about it." Mm-hmm. And, and I think his terms are, it didn't occur to it me. It didn't occur to me, yes. Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, you just want to say, well, why didn't it occur to you? Yeah. How so, could you not think about that? So you're a doctor. I know, there you go, right? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah, and which which is also, it's like a, some um, a, a, a absurd, absurdly... Um, um, healing to me <laughs> that even oh, sorry. even a doctor doesn't understand this and and uh so I'm, I'm 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 laughing with you on that but i it is something that again that's not something that can be taught because it's so um unpredictable and i don't think anybody has written that in a book someplace to help those of us that that want to help uh, folks on the autism spectrum can't write about that because it it changes all the time. Like once you think you've got it figured out, well, the 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 playbook changes. Yes. So we're talking about Josh just now, and that you see that with him, who who functions very well in certain areas of his life. He's able to come and do this podcast and and. Uh, We've seen improvements in him from doing this. I've asked him about it. And he said, well, because it gets me to think about things that I don't think about, which is which is pretty cool. Yes. But this is, you're out there on a daily basis in the community helping to educate. 
and you have groups and in a one-on-one you help people on the spectrum in all all facets of life so is this something that kind of you see that that's that's similar knowing that knowing that autism or not people are individuals is this something that you see is there kind of a, a theme that what we see with Josh is is also out there or is this something that's that's um just Josh no this is this is not a this is not one of the the wonderful characteristics of just Josh um this definitely is something i've I've seen before um and I did want to mention too in in talking about parents as caregivers and how they are um you know that there are no rules for the the playbook uh they are or the playbook changes there are it's I think it's something very important, and I think as any kind of caregiver, parents forget it a lot. Um, you need to take care of yourself uh, as as a caregiver uh, because you will get burnt out or you can get burnt out um, and it's stressful and it's hard and things that you can do talking with other parents who have kids on the spectrum um, going and and treating yourself to uh, I don't know. Uh, a walk in the park, a manicure and a pedicure, if that's your happens to be your thing, and caring for that, and I, I try to, and everything that I do um, is to stress with parents that it's that it's you have to take care of you, and I think as caregivers in any capacity, we forget that because caregiving can feel really good, and and it can be uh, it can be a big charge, especially when you see successes, but when you see things that. I think when people see things that you don't, they don't understand, or they don't, um, that just don't make sense, or are just incredibly frustrating, the stress builds. Uh, and I, you know, I've told parents before, you know, if you don't take care of you, you're not going to be any use to the person that you're giving care for. We met. I guess Josh was twenty six. He's twenty nine now, so I. So it I must just, have been yes. So. He's 20, 26 years old, and the first time that you and I talked um, was on the phone, and you asked me that question. You said, how are you? And it wasn't at the beginning a nicety, how are you today? Right. It wasn't that. <laughs> it, 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 it was far into the conversation. And you said, so, how are you? What are you doing for you? And I didn't have an answer <laughs> because... You are the first person that has ever asked me that question. There, there is, there are no doctors. There's been no therapist. There's been no anything in regards to Josh's support that has ever asked me how I was doing. And it, it, it again, it was so foreign a concept <laughs> that I didn't have an answer. I, it's, it's, a, it, it was, it was strange. And uh, nice, <laughs> and I, I appreciated that. And it really, I, I think, is something. I'm so glad that you just said that because to anybody that's listening to this, it's so important to take care of yourself as a as a caregiver. When we talk about setting up a plan and and implementing um, a plan as a parent. It, it'll work and then it won't work and it'll work and it won't work and what it does is it just kind of wears you down and I do know that when we first talked I was looking for a place for Josh to live because it had gotten so dysfunctional and so frustrating and at the time he was refusing to take medicine and we just felt like the, the real question was are we doing him a service by having him live here at home? If this is the best he can be with us and we're getting nowhere and, and everybody is feeling the, the hurt of, of this situation, is he going to be better served at a, a residential, in a residential um, home? Because we didn't know what else to do. We didn't have anything else to offer. So at that point, when you asked me, I think you asked, and then I think I just like bowled like a baby. 
<laughs> um, because it's it's overwhelming at times, and uh, I, I I don't. It, so I've been doing this for twenty nine years. I still don't know what I'm doing with him. It's sometimes it feels like I don't know how to help him. Do you ever have those experiences as a professional that you think you've got it figured out and then it shifts and you're going, uh, I don't know what to do. Oh, without a doubt. Without a doubt. I mean, in a lot, like, like any caregiver, what I try to do, uh, is, well, and first off, I think in asking you how you were doing, I think that is, um, I don't know that I learned that anywhere. I think it's the little part of Josh that it, that is in me too. Well, it just, that's what came to mind and that, but it's as far as getting stuck, uh, because I do, uh, and probably more than I, I would like to admit. Um, uh, but, and as part as being a caregiver in my own way, uh, reaching, I've learned very quickly that I don't know what I don't know. Uh, and contrary to having, you know, being a doctor and what some people call an autism expert, I don't know everything. I really would love to tell you that I do, <laughs> uh, but I don't. Uh, but reaching out to colleagues, reaching out to parents, um, reaching out to mentors that I've had in the past, uh, and just flat out coming out and saying, you know what, I don't know what to do. I am stuck. Uh, nothing is working. I've tried X, Y, and Z. It's not working. And trying to reach out for those different resources that are available has been, uh, and sometimes that's hard because who wants to admit, you know, it, that you know the that you know what you don't know exactly what to do when you should, when you feel when you feel like you should know what to do. Uh, yeah, it, that's a big difference. It's not. It's yeah. it's not easy. Right. A lot of times it's not easy. When you work with families, mm -hmm. though, you don't... So you get to see up close what that's like. What it's like for families as a, as a unit and how they function. And um, t to be able to see what works and what doesn't work. Um, and so to, for, you to, to, for us to have this understanding that it's not just Josh. Right. These are these are um, situations that happen across the board. And, you know, Josh and I like to say, too, is that sometimes the things that we talk about with folks on the autism spectrum, it, just because we're talking about that, that is brought up. But those situations are the same without autism spectrum sometimes. Yes. <laughs> like the family unit is working some days and falling apart other days, and that's ha that happens with, with all kinds of people all over the world um uh so josh's dad w wanted me to ask you a question today um so he wants to know is there something that you've seen or found that can be done which brings about long-term improvements yeah well thanks josh's dad <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know how to to answer that. Uh, is there something that I've seen or done? Uh, I mean, I, I, I have seen huge successes, and I have seen long-term improvement in a lot of the folks that I work with. Um, they, I, I can't say, and honestly, that it, it's been everyone. I, I, I'm trying to, to go through the Rolodex in my head or the, the Google search in my in my head to say what has worked, what has been the things. Support, ha and not just support from the family is something that has an influence, but support from the community, support from educators and all that can help. Um, but I don't, that's not the end all be all by any means. Um, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how that would be answered. Because to me, it, I sort of asked the question after we were just talking about the subject, kind of, but it because it falls in that category of everybody's an individual, and and <clears throat> excuse me, the difference is that what we're talking about specifically is that if if I'm gonna if I learn something new, um, and it becomes part of my life, 
then that becomes a repetition that takes place. Whether it's a different thought process, whether it's a different action that I take every day. So I can integrate that into my pattern right. of how I live. What we're talking about specifically is um, somebody on the autism spectrum can be made aware of something for self-awareness or it can be taught something and they see the need for it and yet they can go along and make that a part of their pattern and then all of a sudden it changes and that's where the difficulty comes in and and then as the caregivers around that individual we try to adjust try to get them back on track and it, to me what that describes life with somebody that has that is on the spectrum it's my life with Josh is that you're trying to always adapt while keeping the keeping the boat steady you know and um what you're talking about when you the answer is i don't know is essentially because it changes so often I would, I would really like if you figure out the answer to that. <laughs> if, if you could please share it with me. Um, so when I am asked that question, I can I can feel moderately uh, intelligent uh, or, or knowledgeable or aware. Uh, it, so I I would I would appreciate that if you would share the answer with me. Um, when you when you uh, so you you provide an opportunity. With your with your folks to be in group setting, um, if there's there's something here that it feels to me that I don't know what it is, but it feels that there's got to be something that resembles a pattern, but I don't know what it is. So all the kids get together in a group, and they function, and they interact, and something that you're doing with them resonates something you're drawing something out of them that they don't experience maybe in other aspects of their life so even though they we're talking about the changes that take place there's parts of them that are really pretty steady right i don't i don't know about that the they they do they interact with it's it's not all sunshine and roses there are a lot of um, I, I don't even know how many times I, I've said, oh, hey, you know what? Let's try that again. Uh, whether they've said something um, that just isn't, isn't, comes across as not being very nice or not very socially acceptable. Uh, and I say multiple times, all right, let's, let's try that again one more time. Uh, because the, um, so there, there are supports, but there's nothing, there's nothing that, it's not intrinsic with any kind of group that you have that comes together. And I think this, this, these, these are the four words, but I've been trying to pull it up in my head and it's not coming. I think it's forming, storming, and performing, and there's one more, um, which describes any group that comes to, I wish I could remember so I could sound smart. <laughs> uh, <laughs> or remember, this is from one of the classes that I took in, when I was in, getting my bachelor's degree. So it, it was, you know, before, you know, before the end of dinosaurs. <laughs> uh, they, um, but describes any kind of group dynamic that comes together. Um, you know, forming, the group comes together. Storming, there it is. Uh, ah, forming, norming, storming, and performing. There it is. I knew it would come up Ta-da! eventually. Woo! <laughs> you know? uh, forming, they they come together. Then there's that norming where all right things seem pretty good and are going on, and then there's storming mm-hmm. where all of a sudden personalities come into play, ideas, uh, how people interact with each other, um, and then the performing when all of those things are worked out. And I think that's where you see the long term successes. The uh, one of the things that you made me think about when you were talking about this was um, in the middle school social skills group that that Josh helps me out with. I had a parent say to me, you know, you always were, I always wonder if these classes that I do and these social groups and trainings that I do, is it having any effect? 
is there an outside gain? Is there a long-term game? And I, I had a, a parent come up to me last week uh, and say to me that, that her son had made a, had, who has had a history of not having any friends um, outside of contrived situations, uh, had made a friend in school, and they made plans to hang out. Mm. I you know tears in my eyes, you know, <laughs> tears in her eyes. We we were we were a hot mess, yeah. um, but to to kind of see that that this hasn't been an easy road for him, and you know, but he's taking the things that that he's been learning um, that I don't necessarily see the extension of in class. Of course, I see I see some things, but then to hear that you know he's at school mm-hmm. and has taken this and has just taken it on and done it is one of the the coolest things as far as groups getting together you know, he went to the performing stage because we definitely went through the storming stage <laughs> yeah i i don't i understand exactly what you're talking about because that moment of of finally them finally having a friend and and making that connection is is huge it's gigantic. Well, I know that that just like was healing to you, healed your heart. Oh, absolutely. Some. When it's more reinforcement, because you know, uh, I'll readily admit I do like being reinforced for what mm-hmm. I do. Sure. Um, it reinforces that what I'm doing is 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 meaningful, uh, and it's impactful, which totally fuels. You know what I do and why I do it uh, helps a lot with my ego as well. The, uh, <laughs> just, you know, it's always to feel. It's always it always feels good that you can see some results of hard work that you're doing. Right, right. We've talked about the hardships of finding that pattern and getting things to work and and how they break down, but people with autism can be successful. They can go to college. They can um, get a job. So those things are possible. So what we've just talked about was the, the, the tough parts of it. But they can thrive. And and you help them um, in what you do as well, too, right? Like you help to... Um, but you also work with clients on their job skills and with employers on autism awareness and how to accommodate the needs of a worker with autism. Right. And that must be really rewarding as well because you, you, when the, what we just talked about was the kind of the difficult part of it. But this is the successful part of it. This is somebody ready for this next step, and you help to facilitate um, this success and this opportunity. Is that something that you do a lot of, or is it these days, or it's not some not really a, a huge part of it? Um, I don't know that I do more so than I'm doing than I do with other things that I do. Um, I am seeing a lot more folks that I work with that that come to me that are, are in need of those skills. I'm also seeing it um, being more of a community that's accepting to them. Um, and it might start with the very, very basics of how do you how do you fill out a job application? How do you interview with somebody effectively in that? And I've seen nice things from that and successes with that as far as they go in for job interviews and they're prepared for them, well, as much as anybody can be prepared for a job interview, uh, they but they they have that confidence about them. You know, how should you dress for an interview? Mm-hmm. You know, if you're just kind of cold calling and going into a store and asking about, um, you know, are there any positions available? Not doing that uh, when you're stinky and smelly, or when you're not dressed well. Not that you have to dress up, because again, that might be seen as a little bit peculiar. If you're looking for, if you're looking for a job at, at a place that wouldn't require that kind of dress and mm-hmm. and that's but that's a a skill all the same mm-hmm. to be taught but i have I have seen successes and you talk about people uh, with autism being able to have success with without a doubt 
is true if you look at um, Dr. Temple Grandin, who is mm-hmm. an adult woman with autism, who I'm mm-hmm. just in awe of mm-hmm. every single time I see her speak or read one of her books. And she was nonverbal when she was younger and had a lot of behaviors um, that I don't know if they'd be termed aggressive, but were definitely um, expressive um, in a not so productive way. Uh, challenging to say the least um, and she's she is now has a PhD mm-hmm. she revolutionized the cattle transport industry um, yes. using her skills that she had that ability to look at different things um, and kind of put them all together uh, and just as done you know auth- and has authored many many books that are, are wonderful sources and they are, you know, we've definitely talked about a lot of the challenges, but there, there is that success. Employment is hard. There, are, I really wish I, I could say. And as you were, as you were asking the question, I thought, all right, well, how, how can I, I answer this? Um, I've seen some successes. I have not seen as many successes as I would like, mm-hmm. and I don't like that. Right. To that, I, I haven't seen that. Uh, because it mean, it means that I'm missing something that needs to be facilitated. Well, the thing that comes to mind for me when we're talking about getting a job, it, what what goes along with that is adulthood, right? So somebody that's at an age to get a job has also experienced that the the benefits. Uh, that they've received up until the time they turned 18 have disappeared for the most part because mm-hmm. a lot of programs that are implemented once once somebody turns 18 those end and so there it's a feeling of being alone out there finding their way in a in a in a totally new world and it, it's different than so anybody that gets done with high school, it's a totally different experience. Right. Okay, so they get, get get out of high school, whether they go to college or they get a job, it's a totally different life, mm-hmm. way of living. But with somebody with autism, the supports that are in place, those being gone, um, I feel like it's something that it, it would is something that our country and the world needs so desperately is a way of of um, supporting the people on the autism spectrum when from the time they turn 18 so okay this is your adult life because I, some of the things that are in place now I, I think well don't you know that I mean they're still alive <laughs> they're still and they're turning still 18 be, doesn't mean autism is gone right right and it feels like the the benefits that were in place um, are gone. Now what do they do? And it seems to me that there has been a period of time where Josh like kind of fell through the cracks. Like in in trying as as, as parents, Dave and I try to do what we can. We contact different agencies to find out that they don't provide services. For somebody on the spectrum like Josh, um, and it's really, really difficult to help him to move forward. And then it goes back to what we were talking about, where there's a start and stop, mm-hmm. start and stop, start and stop. And um, so it's it's uh, something that I think our country really is in desperate need of is that understanding and something that can be put in place to help adults with autism. Most of the time, there's not even a place for them to live. Right. So they live with parents or family. And if that's not the case, unfortunately, they're homeless. Um, because if they don't qualify to get into a residential home or one of the... I know that there's different terms. Right. If they don't qualify for that. What are they going to do? And and so navigating adulthood as a person on the autism spectrum is a very difficult thing to do. They are a couple things came to mind. Hopefully I can keep them all in my head as I talk about them. Um 
as far as the the turning 18 and and post high school (laughs) there we are (laughs) um there are some things that can be done as far as um, preparing for life after high school uh they are i have and i have and this i was thinking about this uh i have a lot of of folks i work with that have entered and completed college i have folks that i work with that um, have bachelor's degrees and are, have, I don't have any with advanced degrees yet, but I have a couple that are working on it. And they, again, it, it comes back to that there can actually be successes, but they're one of the things that I'm doing right now that I'm trying to work with my folks that are, are juniors and seniors that are planning to go to college and working with their families as far as preparing them. So it's about that time that we wrap it up today. And, uh, you know, I just want to so Chrissy, I'm so thankful that you're here. And, and, you know, I'm also thankful that you are Dr. Christine Ogilvy, <laughs> but we call you Chrissy. <laughs> That's well, pretty I, cool. I, I tell people, you know, aside that I tell them I'm a school geek, um, that uh, I, Chrissy is who I am. Yes. Uh, you know, Dr. Ogilvy is, is a title that I've earned through a lot of hard work, hard work. Uh, but I um, I generally tell people that if I'm not incredibly happy with how things are going on in my interactions with them, I will ask them to call me Dr. Ogilvy. <laughs> or if I need a restaurant reservation because I get a real kick of calling up and saying, yes, this is Dr. Ogilvy. I need a reservation for four. Uh, because and I don't know. It just makes me feel good. <laughs> it just, it's a random Chrissy fact, but I do prefer Chrissy because that's who I am. Right. <laughs> that's hysterical. Um, so I want to uh, just any any last thoughts that you have or, or messages that you'd like to give. Um, what would you like for like the general population to know about folks that are on the autism spectrum? I, I think I would I would encourage anyone to get out and have the chance to you know volunteer or I would say do research, but to get to know people with autism, get to know the Joshes because my gosh, you know it's as much as it's a mystery, it's it's a wonderful wonderful thing interacting with folks with autism, and they're challenging and they're interesting and they're wonderful and they're frustrating uh, and. Everything that you try is not going to work necessarily every day. And you might not necessarily see immediate gains. A lot of us like that that immediate gratification. I mean, I know I do. Mm -hmm. Um, But you might not see that from work that you do. But it doesn't mean that a week or two later, um, the young man that I mentioned in the middle school class, um, that was after six weeks Mm -hmm. of going to class that we saw that him take what he's learned and put out there so it's you might not see it and the um the importance of that is is that you just don't give up you don't you don't decide uh, that you know what's not working that's it because it might or it might be working in ways that you just don't know uh and so i would just encourage uh people to to keep trying yeah keep on keeping on (laughs) because uh it's it's so worth it and not only are the Joshes, our Joshes of the world can benefit of it, but we can benefit of it. Uh, and so there's there's that ultimate goal of just trying to make things you know, just better. Um, mm-hmm. But you're not going to, if you, if you don't give our Joshes of the world that chance, then boy, are you missing out. Mm. I agree with that completely. Mm. And I think it's a good place for us to end the podcast. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much for for giving me this opportunity uh, by talking. Uh, the uh, they say people with autism have restricted interests, uh, and autism is definitely one of my restricted <laughs> interests. Uh, and so I, I I welcome the chance to hopefully make an impact um, and uh, to talk about it. Yeah, it was that uh, I appreciated you being here, and and uh, hopefully we can have you back. Um, if you're willing to put up with the questions again. And, yeah, I appreciate that. Chrissy, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Everybody out there, thank you so much for hanging out with uh, Dr. Christine Olvey and myself today. And uh, we'll see you next week. Love you. Mm-hmm.